Hey everybody, this is Mr. Mob coming at you again with another A Push video. This is our fifth video on topic 3.10, shaping a new republic. Now, uh, in previous videos, we've looked at uh, various aspects of the Washington presidency, from uh, foreign policy affairs to uh, domestic issues. But by 1796, Washington had to make a very important decision. Uh, election was coming up again. The election was coming up again. Uh, and Washington had to decide whether or not he wanted to run for a third term. Now, uh, if Washington ran for a third term, it would be his to win. Uh, you know, so there really wouldn't be too much competition, even though maybe he's not 100% as much universally respected as he was eight years earlier due to the formation of uh, political parties and stuff like that. But Washington is still a very beloved figure in the United States. So if he wanted to run for a third term, he would win a third term. But he stunned some by announcing that he would not seek a third term and instead go into retirement. Uh, Washington uh, was a big believer in the story of Cincinnati. And for those of you that are not familiar with the story of Cincinnati, Cincinnati was a Roman that lived uh, in the early years of the Republic uh, when the Goths came and invaded. Uh, the Roman Senate goes to him and asks him to become dictator of Rome, giving him absolute powers if he would uh, be willing to stop the invasion of uh, the Goths. He begrudgingly takes on the responsibility out of a concern for uh, the fate of Rome itself. In the end, he'll lead forces to defeat the, the Goth invasion, uh, and he has absolute power. Now, uh, stunning almost everybody, Cincinnati decides that when the war is over, instead of maintaining that universal power, he retires and goes back to his plow. Uh, this was the story, maybe perhaps the ultimate story of virtue in Roman uh, Republican history. And Washington tried to fancy himself as the modern American Cincinnati. And there was no more Cincinnatian of a thing to do than to, when basically given ultimate power, to walk away for what is best for the country. So he decides to walk away, but he doesn't walk away without leaving a few pearls of wisdom. Uh, on his way out, Washington will work with Alexander Hamilton to pen what is going to be dubbed the Farewell Address. And basically, it's not a speech. It's going to be a letter that will be published in newspapers across America that are basically going to be his words of wisdom to the future leaders of America in terms of what he's learned and what he would advise moving forward. Uh, included in these words of advice, uh, he would you know, extol the virtues of avoiding permanent alliances with European powers. Uh, even though Britain and France you know, both wanted America as allies and there were members uh, within his own cabinet that had certain views on, on siding with Britain or France or whomever, Washington truly believed that staying neutral at this critical juncture as America is still in its infancy as an independent nation it's going to be what's best. Use the advantage of being uh, an ocean away from the perpetual wars of, of Europe. So avoid permanent alliances, stay neutral, stay isolated over here in the Western Hemisphere. In addition, uh, Washington you know, extols the concerns of the, the future of America due to the emergence of political parties. Now, political parties will emerge during his presidency, uh, you know, scholars at the time, you know, like Madison would write that you can't ever really get rid of factions or political parties. You can only hope to kind of limit their negative influence. And Washington's very concerned about that because he's already seen in his own administration how political parties had, you know, to some degree ripped asunder his own cabinet. You know, uh, Hamilton and Jefferson at each other's throats over a number of issues and Jefferson ultimately resigning in protest. So he doesn't believe the political parties are very good for the nation as a whole. He finds them to be divisive and self, uh, self-centered. self uh, He also is mindful of concerns about future sectionalism. When we say sectionalism, we're talking about uh, the idea of uh, North versus South uh, as having competing and divergent interests. Uh, we're already seeing a Northern half of the United States that is starting to kind of model itself in the Hamiltonian vision of becoming more urbanized, uh, more manufacturing-based economy, more welcoming of immigrants, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, versus the the southern United States, which is still going to be much more rural. Uh, it's going to be tied to slavery. Um, you know, very very divergent needs and values culturally. So he's very concerned about that. Uh, 
You know, now, of course, when we look back at, you know, Washington's advice, many would argue that that was really great advice at that time. Uh, and note, uh, you know, what to what degree do we follow Washington's advice? Uh, you know, we certainly don't see political parties going away. I mean, there'll be a, a brief time in the 1820s. The Air of Good Feelings world will basically be like that. But in perpetuity, you know, since Washington's presidency, we've always had competing political parties. Uh, sectionalism does not improve at all uh, for the next 70 years, uh, leading up to a horrifically bloody civil war. Uh, so that is not really heated. Uh, and isolationism, now note, of these, isolationism will be the most heated, or at least for the longest. Uh, we'll go a good hundred years, approximately, saying a basically, you know, an, as being a globally isolated country, really only concerning ourselves, for the most part, with issues in uh, North America, the Western Hemisphere. It won't be until we get to the age of imperialism, you know, about, you know, 100, about 100 years later, before America starts to become this global power and does get involved in global conflicts like the world wars of the 20th century, etc. Uh, but never really, you know, you, you can't overstate the significance uh, of Washington walking away after, after two terms. Uh, because when he does it, like so many other things in his presidency, he's setting a precedent for future presidents. And there's going to be a, a number of presidents that will follow that tradition. Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Jackson, uh, Ulysses S. Grant. Uh, there's a number of them uh, that are going to go and do that two-term tradition. Uh, T.R. basically does the, the two-term tradition. It's not until FDR in 1940 before that tradition is finally broken. And, and because that tradition had been around for so long and FDR finally breaks it, there is a concern that you might have future presidents for life. So that's so. Shortly after FDR's uh, presidency is up, we do see the Twenty Second Amendment ratified that now limits the president to two terms in office. So you know Washington rides off into the sunset, uh, really establishing what the executive branch means, what the presidency means, and for most historians, you know, really doing about as good a job as he possibly could at this very very critical point and putting the needs of uh, Americans first. Now with the retirement of George Washington, that's going to mean that in 1796, we're going to have our first truly competitive presidential election, and it will feature uh, the first vice president, John Adams, against the first secretary of state, Thomas Jefferson, uh, both, you know, of, of different factions politically at this point in time. Adams, basically a federalist. Jefferson, head of the Democratic Republicans. It's going to be a very close election, but Adams is going to eke out a very, very short, uh, very, very narrow victory. Now, note, unlike his predecessor, John Adams doesn't have that, you know, kind of universal respect that people defer to in in uh, in leadership. Uh, Adams was, you know, criticized uh, early on and heavily by members of the opposition party, Jefferson's Democratic Republicans. I mean, uh, you know, if you think the media is biased and, you know, full of vitriol today, well, go back to the 1790s. It's just as bad, if not worse. And Adams is going to be eviscerated in these uh, Jefferson-owned newspapers. Uh, and note, John Adams does not have the thickest skin in the world. You know, he is very easily slighted. He, you could argue maybe doesn't have the most confidence in the world, you know, as as uh, as president following the, the big shoes of George Washington. So he doesn't he doesn't handle this criticism very well. And we'll see as a result the passage of some very, very controversial laws. These are going to collectively going to be known as the Alien Sedition Acts. And basically what this does is try to basically thwart the ability of the Democratic Republicans, the ability of Jefferson to try to criticize his presidency, to criticize fellow Federalists in Congress. Uh, what this does is include what's going to be called the Naturalization Act, which is going to make it uh, harder to become a citizen. This was done uh, in part because you know, most of these immigrants that are coming over are going to be joining Jefferson's party. And so the idea being is that if you reduce the number of immigrants, you reduce the number of the opposition as far as Adams is concerned. We also see uh, within the Alien Act, uh, it's going to make it easier to deport uh, immigrant aliens that are deemed dangerous. And of course, you can kind of read between the lines here, dangerous meaning being willing to oppose the Federalist uh, Party. Uh, we also see within the Sedition Act, uh, that it's basically going to be outlawed 
to criticize the president and Congress in the media. It doesn't explicitly say that, but the way the rules are written, it's basically going to be doing that. It's going to be muzzling criticism, open published criticism of the federal government. And this is going to really, really make Jeffersonians nervous. You know, once again, they're always fearful of what a big, strong federal government might do. And look at what this big federal government's doing. It is st trying to stomp out opposition. It's trying to muzzle uh, criticism. Uh, you know, one would argue that, you know, the Adams presidency, the Federalists are willing to, you know, destroy natural rights in order to, you know, avoid criticism. So these are going to be things that are going to be consistently hurled back at John Adams and trying to paint him as, as somewhat tyrannical in his presidency, or at least not able to withstand any kind of public criticism. Now, these laws won't last on the books very long. Uh, they were set to expire in 1801, and when Jefferson does become the next president in that year, uh, he and the Democrat Republican Control Congress do not choose to extend those laws. So they don't last very long, but it is an important chapter in what's going to be a narrative throughout American history of times when the federal government will attempt to try to limit free speech in America. And it does raise an important constitutional question. How far does free speech go? Uh, we know it's not absolute. Uh, we also know that it's designed to be able to, to voice one's opinion in government, but how far does it really go? Uh, and speaking of speaking out, I wanted to round out this uh, lesson by taking a look at what are going to be dubbed the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions. Now, once again, when we look at the Alien Sedition Acts, there's a, and when you look at the Alien Sedition Acts and you look at the, the creation of the Bank of the United States and other things that have been done in the Washington Adams presidencies, if you are Jefferson and Madison of the Democratic Republicans, you are concerned that, you know, maybe we've got this big growing Goliath called the federal government that seems ready and willing to crush the liberty of the individual states, you know. Uh, and, and so there's a, a sense to try to push back against that in what are going to be uh, letters written by the Kentucky legislature and the Virginia legislature. Now, note, these are going to be shadow authored by Jefferson and Madison themselves. And what they're going to be asserting in these resolutions uh, is really what they deem to be the, what is the legitimacy of the federal government? Where does it get its authority from? And as far as Jefferson and, and his party is concerned, the federal government only exists because the states allow the Constitution to exist. That the Constitution was not created by individual people uh, to create a singular country. It was created by the states themselves, which means if the states created the Constitution, then the states should have the ultimate authority in terms of what the Constitution means. So, yes, we have a Supreme Court, and it's been alluded to so far that it has judicial review power to basically interpret what federal law means, but we still haven't had Marbury versus Madison, which formally asserts that. And even afterwards, there's still going to be this notion by Jeffersonians that the states should have that final authority in terms of dictating what the Constitution means. In other words, if the federal government is overreaching in its authority, states should be able to do what we call nullify those federal laws, to make them null and void in their states. The idea being is, how can you trust a federal judiciary to determine what is constitutional or not with the federal Congress and the federal president? The idea being is that they're all parts of the same federal government. They, they'll be in cahoots. They're not going to do anything that's going to limit the power of another branch within that level of government. So you can't trust one part of the federal government to tame the other part of the federal government. You can only trust the state governments to do that. Now, no, what this is going to do, you know, in the name of trying to protect state rights and state liberty and things like that, uh, it is going to raise an important constitutional debate uh, over, you know, how far do states' rights go? You know, do the states have or should the states have the ability to nullify federal law? Uh, you know, how far does this go? Uh, and, and this is going to be a major debate uh, in the first half of the 19th century. And unfortunately, what's going to become a major part of this debate eventually is the issue of slavery. You know, when it comes to can the federal government pass certain laws and can the states nullify them, what eventually becomes this most important law or policy will be federal attempts to limit or outlaw slavery and states wanting to nullify federal laws that might do that. Ultimately, of course, this doesn't get settled until over 600,000 Americans are killed in what will be the Civil War. Okay, that's the 1790s for you. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.